esto ya. Hello, hello, and welcome to the first installment of Christine and Guests as part of TFF's live programming. Um, I'm really excited to be welcoming you all tonight to meet the founder and CEO of a company called Blend Hub, and his name is Henrik Stam Christensen. He is what you would call a nonconformist and a visionary entrepreneur who's founded four food tech companies and one community platform and has invested more than 50 million euros because he's committed to make change in the entire agri-food chain and make access to food and nutrition fairer and safer, reaching more pe people in more places. So Henrik, tell us a little bit, what is Blend Hub and why did you start it? It sounds crazy, right? Thank you very much for having me tonight. And uh, you and me, Christine, we have been talking a long time about finding a moment. So what better moment than to be here live uh, uh, with you and having people listening to our conversation. So at least uh, everyone will know what we are talking about. And I'm sure that will be a lot of good stuff. I'm excited. Uh, yeah. My story is, of course, uh, is, is long because, uh, and I will do it very, very short, uh, and then we can come back to bits and pieces. But, um, you know, I actually started with the food industry when I was around 14 years old. And I said to my mom, I wanted to manage the biggest company in the world. So since then, you know, for 35 years have gone and, uh, and you read a certain, a certain age and you look back and it's, of course, very easy to connect the, connect the dots uh, backwards. So I worked for 12 years in a, in a multinational food ingredients company. And I was so lucky that I got exposed to so many different areas, everything from raw material purchase of the most weird products from seaweeds to a downgraded citrus peel that were taken up for extraction and turned into powders and highly valuable ingredients that were again put into food products that were used by brands that were distributed and going to final consumers. Mm -hmm. But uh, after 12 years in multinationals, and uh, of course, you start learning more about yourself. And one of the things you, you of course, uh, see is what you're good at and what you're not good at. And political, let's say, correctness is not my strong side. <laughs> so, uh, so I was thinking a couple of times about it was probably about time to find my, my own ways. But um, of course, finding your own ways uh, in 1996 uh, is a little bit difficult. So I started calling a little bit around because there was no venture capitals and there was no thought for food and great uh, startup events and incubators and accelerators. So, um, so I called a couple of companies and asked them if I couldn't distribute their products in Spain because right. my last job was, was actually in the Iberian uh, Peninsula. Mm -hmm. And as a Viking traveling around the world, I was very fascinated about Latin countries Mm -hmm. Because being political incorrect and not having, you know, the strictness of the Nordics, mm -hmm. where basically you are, you are structured from, from birth to death, <laughs> I found myself great in, in Latin countries. So I decided to start this, um, this company and I said from day one, and that was a little bit funny as well, that I didn't want to be a distributor, I wanted to be a blender. And in the end, you know, I've heard all this about the blends and one of the things I never understood with blends is they were all black box. So I said, I want to be a blender and I want to kill the black box. So my founding principle was basically kill the black box. <laughs> and of course, after then, and when you have no money and you start in a small garage in southeast of Spain, where you are paying a thousand euros in rent, you start by paying a, and buying third hand machinery and a blender. You're like the Steve Jobs of the food industry. I mean, this is Silicon Valley, like homebrew computer club. Here we go. I Breaking tell all the you, and one of my, my fantastic colleagues that unfortunately is not with us today, but, uh, but she was a crane engineer. So I got her into the company, you know, to manage uh, the structure of a blending in food industry that had nothing to do with that. So, so she was <laughs> probably, you know, the other part of, uh, of the story on, on, the, on the initial road. However, it actually went very well. So we started supporting B2B industry with recipes. Okay. And when you are starting doing recipes uh, with a small lab and a couple of technicians to the Spanish food industry, of course, you need to find ingredients. So we, we decided to concentrate on the world's biggest food product that is powder. And, you know, in the end, when you start with powder and you don't have so much money, you start with the minor powders. And that was what we knew about. So that was what, what I call the technological powders, the ingredients 
that is less than 2% of the recipe. So we were picking bits and pieces. Mm -hmm. We were putting that into recipes and we went to dairy industry, to meat industry, to cheese industry, beverage industry, and we sold our know-how. But in the food industry, you're not selling know-how. It's just, just like that because you can come and knock the doors and people don't want to buy your know-how. So we sold a product instead. Right. Let's that just pause for a minute really quick because I want to make sure like everyone, we now have like 30 people and more coming on. Um, how ubiquitous food powder is in the food industry. That was certainly a big aha moment for me. I mean, it's in everything, like even ice cream and all kinds of, you know, consumer products are based on food powder. So maybe can you just take like 30 seconds and explain a little bit like what food powders are used for? 100%. Um, it's funny you say it because in the Western world, uh, I got a prize from a Spanish business magazine a couple of years ago. And, uh, and the leader of that business ma magazine, she says, I hate powders. Yeah, exactly. And she was, and she <laughs> was a baby milk. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sit with a foodie in the Western world and you yeah. say powder. Yeah. And it's like the most nasty word they ever heard. Yeah. And then you say, hey, are you giving your infant nutrition? Mm -hmm. Are you having Nespresso? Are you putting sugar or, or stevia or any artificial sugar on your coffee? Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, what do you think is in the ice creams that you get in Burger King? And what about the bread you ate this morning? You know, so you yeah. suddenly start understanding that powder is everywhere. Everywhere. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Okay, so going back to you, you were selling the product. And again, uh, it was going very well. So, you know, when you are constantly like me in discovery modes, mm -hmm. and the uh, discovery mode is, of course, that first of all, you have to make something that makes sense. And that was what come from, came from the recipes and the ingredients. I said, now we need to build a state-of-the-art factory. And you know, when you're not a technician yourself, what is the state-of-the-art factory? So I started looking around and I say, you know, Germans, they must be good at this with the machinery. They're producing Mercedes. Yeah. So I was always, let's say, looking a little bit collaterals. And we found a German producer of machinery and this and that. And in the end, long story short, it took me 36 months and 15 million euros to build what today I call a static factory. Okay. And I said, opening day, February 1st, 2004, I said, this is the most terrible moment in my life. This is, I spent 36 months. If I want to make an impact, I will, go, I will die before I've made factory number five. Right. So, Too you know. Long. Capital investment, time horizons. Yeah. Disrupt that. So I said, you did. this is not good. And because, you know, I had as I promised my mom at 14, I had to run the biggest company in the world. I said to my engineers, I said, day one in production, we need to do this better. Mm -hmm. So uh, we sat down, we wrote the, the letter to Santa Claus and we said, how does a portable factory look like? <laughs> and they were looking at me and said, portable what? 2005? I said, a factory, factory in a box. Factory yeah. where all this thing that we have here in this building, 15 meters high, doing all that stuff, blending, packaging, doing quality control, how can we pack that in? So it ended up with the list. We said, in this 40 foot container, I want everything. Oh, that's certainly a constraint they told me. But amazingly, and with local people from Southeast Spain, we were able in a year and a half, two years, by the end of 2017, we have built a prototype. And one day I stand and look at this prototype. I said, this is completely amazing. So we received the same way of products. We were able to dump it, blend it, pack it, quality control it, and everything in a 40-foot container. Wow. They, when people, they asked me, what, what was that moment? That was this aha moment where you stand in front of the Nespresso machine, but you don't have any capsules. And by the way, you don't have any cups for the coffee either. So <laughs> I said, what do I do with this machine? Yeah. And then, of course, again, jumping immediately after, we said, okay, what now we have this machine? Where's the first place we're going to deploy it? I said, stop. What if we try to patent it? So it ended up a long story short. Uh, people were laughing, you're crazy. Today we have a patent in 75 countries that is, uh, that is uh, still uh, existing until 2030. So this whole story actually gave me the idea and said, let's look at some of the recipes that we actually are producing. And when you're not filling up your actual capacities in your static factories and just look at any of the food producers around in the world, the first thing is always about no, my factory has empty space. I need to use it at, at, at maximum. I said, listen, let's take one of the recipes. Let's find out where the raw materials are coming from, the ingredients. And let's see how much can we save by localizing this specific production. 
Mm -hmm. And that was where we took one of our beverage recipes that was containing gur gum, gur gum coming from India and Pakistan. Mm -hmm. And I said, let's deploy the first production hub in India. They said, couldn't we go to France or to Germany? I said, no way, they don't need us. So my philosophy has always been to find places where people really need you. So I'm constantly looking for opportunities to make impact where people are not saying that this is not possible or people, they already have their static factories. Mm -hmm. And going to India was really a very, very special moment because we were up and running in little more than six months. So in less than six months, we had the factory produced, we had it shipped to India, we were renting a building, we got the building structure to the local uh, legislation to food, maximum food legislations. And suddenly we were up in India with a factory that had European characters, you know. Amazing. And like the latest tech. So it, like basically what you're doing is like exactly this, localizing the supply chain. And so I guess creating a plethora of opportunities for Indian producers and food companies, right, to launch in local markets. And is the alternative then that they would have to sell to a global food company and, you know, take their, if you're a farmer, take the produce to, you know, a Nestle factory somewhere far away is like, what's the problem exactly that you're solving? The problem initially uh, is that for many people, they don't see a problem because as you say yourself, the Gur gum in India is quoting on the Indian stock exchange. So it's a huge product in India. Yeah. Then when you look at how much is this Gur gum, you just take the export statistics. This is why I love data. So you take the export statistics and say, hey, 90% of all the Gur gum is going outside India. Right. And how is this possible? You know, and in a country like India, where they have so much value that is being sold to commodity prices outside anyway. So of course, the actual supply chain is what people accept it is. And this is why that many times I say, for the last 50 years, we have accepted supply chain as is. Right. And of course, when, when we deployed the first hub in India, and we said we could produce with the same quality, with the same safety, with local producers creating local value, we started connecting to the Gua producers and say, hey, why don't you sell to us? And I think the most important thing that will make everyone not when we talk about supply chain is that from 180 days from buying the gore, having it produced, having it shipped, coming to Spain, being controlled in the entrance into the EU, being blended, being packed, yeah. being quality controlled, and being sent back to the Middle East, that was 180 days. Okay. In India today, we have a turnaround time of 10 days. Wow. So, and does it preserve like quality of the product too? Is there an enhanced nutrition, you know, output, et cetera, by, by localizing this? Or is it really just about like kind of, you know, um, the, the efficiency gains that you get? Well, but the Indian, the Indian raw material produces in this case in Gur gum, and by the way, many other local ingredients that we have found in India that is both powdered and yeah. certainly available to create sustainable nutrition are all perfect. The Indians are producing fantastic products. Right. So it's not about that it's better or worse. Yeah. It's about how we do things. Yeah. And this is what I've called my toolbox for many years. You know, If you have a toolbox and you wanna put up a, a frame or a photo on your wall on a Sunday, you go down and you say, hey, I don't have a screwdriver. And then you go back up and say to your wife, sorry, sugar, I can't put up the picture next Sunday. The food industry, I compare it to that. The food industry have been living our own self fatness for 50 years where everything was just running smoothly and no one were really willing to do, let's say, any challenge to the state to quo. Right. And of course, when you see that in India, for again, to make a long story short, I didn't want to be in India just by purpose. I wanted to be able to supply both industry and final consumers cheaper food products. So right. we put a cost calculation on top. And here a couple of weeks ago, I was, I was in the Spanish press and I said, today, we know that with data, in any recipe, I challenge the system that we can save between 20 to 50% of the food product price by localization. Amazing. Amazing. That's so, great. Yeah, I mean, it absolutely is crazy. So are your customers then mainly like the big food companies that are producing, you know, food products with these powders? And have they, what other benefits have they seen by localizing production? Are they incorporating, for example, you know, new types of crops into their, you know, food recipes? 
Is that something you've seen? The fantastic thing about developing, or would I say a redeveloping the global supply chain is that if you read a lot about technology adoption and you can do that in the software as a service or in the smartphone or whatever, and this is why I get a lot of inspiration, you know, from, from, from other areas. Just look at McDonald's and Coca-Cola, what they have done with localization and what power, power they got from localizing, for example, bottler companies uh, not shipping water around the world or McDonald's offering Big Mac basically to anybody on earth, you know? Mm -hmm. So I'm very inspired of a lot of the things that the big ones are doing. Mm -hmm. But the thing is that the other reality is that because some of the big ones have been doing the same for so many years. Nestle was founded 150 years ago. Coke was founded they had no years ago. And if to change, so yeah. They've been building on a hundred years old concept. Mm -hmm. And that means again, what you have seen is that when you look hundred years back, first of all, we were a billion people. We were not 8 billion, nearly 8 right. billion. We were few, many few people. And today, you know, uh, the other thing is that they have been reducing a lot the, uh, for example, the protein sources. 100 years ago, we were, we were having around 30,000 different protein sources. And today we are mainly using 10 different protein sources because we standardize food so much yeah. that of course made sense for this supply chain that is 100 yeah. years old. But yeah. today we are going the complete, completely opposite direction. Yeah. So when we are in India, we talk to small medium enterprises because we made this model for startups and for small medium enterprises. Yeah. So the other day, you know, we, we talked to a company in the US that are taking in from 10,000 farmers in Africa, dried pineapple powder, dried, you know, local powders, very small quantities, yeah. but they're starting creating a completely new supply chain. And this is what the strength for us is that when we are localized, we can help all these small ones because to right. produce five tons for us is nothing yeah. in a six million kilo facility in one line. This is amazing. I want to just like before um, asking the next question, I just want to say to all of our attendees and panelists, like, please do um, ask questions. Henrik has already told me before uh, we went live that he would like to take questions on the fly. So he's a very informal, as you can see, um, unconventional character, very open and ready to take any of your questions. So try to challenge him. <laughs> um, but I want to talk to you a little bit too about, you know, the issue of the day, of course, is COVID and what kind of, I mean, everybody's talking about renationalized supply chains and, you know, the global supply chains are, you know, showing their fragility and how can we solve this? So tell me a little bit about Blend Hub's like role and solution in this arena. That's a great question because when you come from the B2B space and of course, you know, what is omnipresent in the entire agri-food value chain is recipes with ingredients. So it doesn't matter either you sell a pure ingredient or if you blend it with something else, just another thing, then it is a recipe, you know? So everyone understand that the recipe that is being, for example, when you have an ingredient coming from a raw material producer, they standardize eventually. So yeah. the functionality of that ingredient goes on to the blender. So it's always the same. The blender is blending other things in. It goes on to the industry who is blending other things in that goes on to the distribution distribution and yeah. it ends up in the mouth. This is what I call the seed to mouth, right? So when you come from B2B, for me, it has always been the ultimate objective to connect to 8 billion consumers. So I could never see myself just serving B2B. So already a couple, let's say some years ago, we started scoping and ideating how does the meal look like, let's say to any uh, consumer, final consumer. And if it is an only a powder, we always can go to the supermarket and you can see all these bread mixes or you can see the, the soft cake mix, yeah. the pancake mixes mm -hmm. and so on. But we also came to the conclusion a couple of years ago where the soy lens and the huels and all these, you know, newcomers, they were actually serving a fully powder meal. That is what I have felt. Mm -hmm. And the COVID coming back to the COVID, you know, where we are seeing a lot of different I would call it scandals because I, be, I, I, I believe it's scandals. For example, in Spain, there was an article last week that during the last three months for 11,500, let's say, uh, um, lower income families that are living on, on, on help from the, from the community in question in Spain, they, they did not have the access to this, uh, let's say, the help and the kids were not going to school. 
and we read about school meals are no longer served and so on. So why these, these people were receiving pizzas for three months and there is nothing bad in pizza for one day or for two days. I'm not against any of that, but what about supplements and nutrition? Yeah. Well, the worst thing about supplements and nutrition, when we look back to the actual supply chain, what has been put in as protein sources, many times are very expensive. For example, who do not know about whey protein concentrate in infant nutrition that is three times as expensive because it's going for a very fragile person. But today we are doing individualized nutrition. We can do that, for example, for all the hospital workers who are working 18 days, uh, 18 hours a day. Yeah. We can, what about all the hospitalized people around that just need a meal and we don't have cooks enough, you know? So this is how Blendhub have been looking at, at this uh, situation. And we're actually right now just in the middle of creating a, um, a crowdfunding campaign that is based on buy one, give one for free. Because we, of course, want to participate in making everyone aware that yeah. powder is not a nasty word. And it actually can do a lot of good for people who are in extreme situations in a specific moment in time. And I have to share with you, I actually had my mind changed too about Soyland. I was talking to one of my good friends and I've always had this dream, by the way, of bringing under the TFF umbrella, the CEO of Soylent together with someone from Slow Food and just see what happens. You know, I'm sure that would be a riveting debate. But at TFF, we very much embrace that there's not a one size fits all solution to how we're gonna nourish, you know, nearly 8 billion people and growing. Um, and there's specific, you know, circumstances that people go through. And like you rightly mentioned, there's like, you know, hospital workers on the front lines who may not have time to sit down and eat a nourishing meal. There's, you know, also a friend of mine who I was having a chat with about this, you know, he went all in on Soylent for his lunch meal. And uh, I asked him why, you know, and he was talking to me about, you know, he has to drive a lot for his job in the United States. And he said, my option is a drive through fast food restaurant. Or in this case, I can drink, become satiated and get the nutrients like in a way that I feel confident that, you know, I'm nourishing myself. So those types of, you know, real situations, you're like, yes, this is, you know, a dilemma and you can see the point for something like this. Now, should we all be drinking our meals all day, every day? Yeah, I don't think so, but it's, I think under circumstances, there's but a- But I love what you're saying because individual nutrition is about people's choice. Exactly. You know, if you take, for example, we actually presented here six months ago, a nutritional meal to one of these uh, big driving uh, transport, new transport companies, you know, oh, that are- yeah. like stock exchange yeah. and so on, that are mm -hmm. exactly. Mm -hmm. And you know, at the end, I am completely aligned with you. There is certainly nothing and no solution that fits all. Right. But if we, during the last 50, 100 years, whatever, have been telling consumers what to eat, in these times we are now, we will no longer tell consumers what to eat. We will actually be asked by consumers to serve them products that are traceable, that are secure, and that are adapted to their flavors or to their religion or to their belief and to their taste, you know? And this is why when you come back and we talk about the B2C or the consumer food products where Blendhub want to be, because our multi-localization can do an enormous amount of good in that, you know, in that space, we are actually listening using data to final consumers. And that is why, again, that just for, for everyone on the call here to understand, Blendhub did not localize a factory. We started with India. Since then we have deployed seven, we call it the world's first network. So anyone that comes to us being Soylent or a small Indian producer of uh, ice cream mixes or whoever that is, once they have validated one of the factories, they have validated a network of factories. So really connected. they have a customer in Latin America. We have a hub for them in Latin America. If they have one in US this year, we hope to be in the US by the end of this year, beginning next year. So, you know, the reason for creating a network is actually to offer, in this case, final consumers via entrepreneurs, startups, all the people you're hosting on TFF. We want to help them being successful. And that is why that in Blendhub and now in the new cloud blending platform that we can talk about a little bit later, if you want, we always have been looking at win, win, win. Yes. Win for the supplier, yep. win for the producer, 
and yeah. wait for the final consumer. Because yeah. if there is no win all the way to the mouth, then it's not a real win. Yeah, I definitely want to talk about the cloud blending. But before I do, just to finish a couple of COVID questions. So right now we're reading all these headlines about oversupply, right? Farmers like having to, you know, replow their vegetables back into the soil or dump their milk and eggs. And I was wondering, like, does BlendHub, like, can you help solve this? Like, can you take their perishable goods and, you know, powderize them so that they can have extended shelf life? Is this, you know, a role you can play? Yeah. It goes perfectly aligned with what I, what I call platforms. And when you read uh, me on, on social media, I talk a lot about platforms. And platforms is, again, that we look upstream and downstream. The good thing about BlendHub is that we have turned our business model from being a product company into a service company. And that was a big step. So actually, in 2015, we decided to kill our own first brand. How many companies do you know with 17 years of success that just killed their own brand overnight? <laughs> and it was funny because people in Spain, they said, oh, Blendhop disappeared. And we actually closed our own recipe development lab by purpose. Wow. And, you know, very few people actually know that. And we did that because we were not able to drive a product company and a service company at the same time. It's very, very difficult, you know? Yeah. So, Coming back to your question about uh, fruit and vegetables, where we know that 20, 30, 40, 50 percent of certain fruit and vegetables are plowed back in. Yeah. We already years ago connected upstream. So when BlendHub is in the middle, we of course buy the powdered ingredients. So we are not the ones who powder them. You're not the one powdering. Okay. But we have a lot of influence on the one that powder them. So what we have done is, first of all, we have very, uh, let's say, detailed selected our suppliers. So we have tried to select value aligned suppliers that, that were aligned with our vision that I think is very important on the platform. And secondly, we have tried to include new suppliers. So what I call our global map of ingredient suppliers, we have been using, we have had a small team actually of five, uh, five young people who have been looking into the world map of ingredients for the last five, six years. We have thousands and thousands of suppliers, of minor suppliers of ingredients online. One of the companies, an example, is actually a company just around the corner here from Southeast Spain that is called Acre Singularity. And when we call it, uh, and when we talk to these people, we have tried to be an inspiration for them as entrepreneurs like you are hosting in TFF. Yeah. And today they actually uh, are creating their own powders on third party factories that is based on waste material. So they have, after three, four years of intensive work, actually not only, uh, let's say, created powders from waste, but they're actually including factories that are in their downtown period, downtime period, are having free capacity. So they go around and they localize the producers when they have little or nothing to do. So they turn these downgraded a waste material into powder. Isn't that incredible? And That's we, absolutely incredible. And we are helping This them. cloud blending? This is, is, this is what we are moving to cloud blending now. I'll tell yeah. you, I'll clarify. It's a little bit okay. crazy. But, <laughs> but the thing is that in a certain way, we always wanted to help. And this is what you can see on our YouTube channel. We mm -hmm. wanted to help new startups being successful because otherwise we are not changing anything. Yeah. And I think Agro Singularity is a great example. They're fantastic people uh, where, you know, we're working together in solving issues, of course, always start from under the radar screen. And this is why we know so much about exponentiality today. You know, if we help them and they're successful, we have more powder. If we have more powder from downgraded material, we are taking care of a certain problem that has to do with waste and wasted water and wasted a series yeah. of things. But we're also giving consumers, final consumers, a possibility to incorporate nutritional ingredients into meals. And one of my passions, and I really believe in this, by the way, is we're able to turn these high, I, I call it the rich man food, because when you look at sports nutrition, you look at all these guys, I don't have these big muscles yet, I'm still trying, yeah. <laughs> but uh, it might be that I eat the wrong things. But, uh, but the thing when you look at prices of sports nutrition, this is rich man food, mm -hmm. right? This is very expensive. But all these nutritional products that in the end you combine based on, on carbohydrates, you, you put fat and then you put protein and then you create a meal with 400 calories and people can eat that. You know, this is yeah. what Soylent does, what Rob Reinhardt, he did. 
for yeah. Zerlang, you know, as, as a calculation. And when you take that calculation and you put this waste material, you are solving so many collaterals at the same time. Yeah, very cool. So like, take me through then the transition to cloud blending, because I've definitely heard of cloud labs, because uh, a few people in our community use this, where they like use lab technologies and machines during their downtime. Is that kind of what you're referencing with cloud blending or how does this work not, in your... Really. Um, yeah. We invented uh, and envisioned envision the, 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 the name cloud blending already back in 2017. Okay. And, you know, that's a little bit the problem by being visionary. Sometimes you launch ideas and names and people <laughs> they say, they say I, I don't get it, you know, so they... <laughs> But, but what has happened is in a very, in a very simple uh, and understandable way. Of course, in BlendHub, we were finding our own legs. As I said, in 15, we killed our own development lab and we started doing service. So we, we turned our model around hosting recipes from third parties with ingredients from third parties. So we connected all that into our hops yeah. as a service model. So instead of selling a product at, for example, five euros a kilo, we were selling a service at 50 cents a kilo, right? Yeah. So it completely changed in the model. So what was the strength of BlendHub? And this is what we have been driving towards the last years. BlendHub today is able to multi-localize food production anywhere in the world in less than six months in a truly replicable model. So we have made the McDonald's model. So like when you call McDonald's and say, I want something down the corner in three yeah. months, you have a Big Mac store around the corner, right? And then we are now offering what we call food as a service. So we have a lot of freelance formulators. We have a lot of ingredient suppliers. I told you about recipe providers and ingredient suppliers. So we have a lot of these people who are collaborating with us. Mm -hmm. this is what Steve Jobs, he called a thousand songs in the pocket. I call it a million recipes in a, in a blend hub today, right? So these are the kind of things we can do today. So we are becoming a, a blend up today is a company that really are using all the hardware and all the software we have created over the last, you know, uh, 15 years. Mm -hmm. And this is the business model. So blend up is in, in serious execution of that model now. And this is why we will deploy more network hubs. And next year we are going franchise as well. So Amazing. we will deploy many more hubs. What is cloud blending? A lot of the things on the BlendHub umbrella, and I will give you one example, are very high-tech solutions and a lot of data-based. So we have been looking a lot on data the last 10 years, mm -hmm. because imagine how it is to drive a factory that is 5,000 kilometers away, yeah. and you only are driving with local people. You need to have an enormous control over your physical installation. Right. Right. One of the things we developed under this umbrella was a very special cloud-based a quality control system because we said, okay, in India, we have incoming ingredients. We don't know exactly who are, you know, when are, where, what batch is it coming from and so on. So we need somebody in Spain where our headquarters still are located today that actually are able to validate the ingredients going into the Indian factory. So we developed this very powerful uh, software that we put on top of a very well-known technology that has been around for 30, 40 years that is called near-infrared spectroscopy. It's yeah. an imaging technology. Mm -hmm. So because we did not like the softwares that the near machinery producers gave us, we decided, you know, as we are challenging the status quo to develop it ourselves. So we made a very easy uh, software and that sits on the blend hub. And we have made that more than 400 libraries of ingredients and 500 yeah. libraries of final recipes. But what makes sense for me right now is to open our hand and say, if we create a platform cloud blending where we can do so much more that is working within BlendHub, why don't we take this software and segregate it on, onto the cloud blending platform? So the cloud blending platform is a platform where we look at better digital tools, digital signatures, a lot of different things that we have been touching upon in BlendHub. So we are basically taking our innov innovation engine and move it out onto the cloud blending platform. And by the way, right now, we are running our first exterior investment, our, our seed funding round A, where we are inviting, let's say, external investors uh, and impact kind of investors into this model to say, if we have more people participating 
in actually making these tools available to anyone yeah. who will be able to scale optimization of global supply chain, traceability, security, and prediction much faster. So this is what cloud blending is about. Very cool, very interesting. I'm getting some questions in from the audience, so I'd love to turn over to them. Um, so you've set up these localized hubs. Can other multinational companies take on your model? And do you think that they will anytime soon? Absolutely. One of the things is that, first of all, I talk too much, but I actually talk too much of purpose because mm -hmm. if we want to make an impact, nothing is mine or yours. It's all about us. The thing is, of course, what we pretend is that we have to be very, very smart and very lean and very fast. Mm -hmm. So what we have done in Blendhub really is that during 15 years, we have been developing an enormous amount of hardware and software under the radar screen. Mm -hmm. So what is actually happening right now, because blending and packaging, the funny thing is, I ask you, what is blending and packaging? People have been having in-house blending and packaging because they wanted to hide their recipes and they wanted to hide what they were doing. Yeah. Just remember the secret Coca-Cola recipe. Yeah, exactly, yeah. Still but easy. today, there is much more understanding that we have so much technology that in the end, you know, I can go and take a Nesquik uh, recipe and I can find out plus minus 0, 0.5% exactly what is inside. Mm -hmm. So it's no longer about the secrecy. It's about making things happen. It's about the famous toolbox. Mm -hmm. And that is again why that we want actually, and we are inviting anyone from startups to small medium enterprises, to the big food and ingredients companies to participate in the model. And what we are seeing right now is a turnaround where some of the big food companies and ingredients companies are starting to come to us and test us. So actually over the last year, year and a half, we have been getting more and more validations of our business model. And one of the biggest in the world, they, they, the funny thing with their engineering departments, they said, but we did not have Blendhub approved. We don't know the Blendhub mixer. So in the very beginning, yeah. they asked about the speed of the blender. I said, it doesn't yeah. matter. Yeah. Can you do your product? Are you satisfied or you're not satisfied? So we are overcoming all these, what I call infant diseases. And we see an enormous drive because nobody wants really to develop a new blender, a new packer, or a new quality control. Yeah. And that is also why we are now going next year franchise. So if everyone, if anyone do not want to support our network, that of course is done for the good of small medium enterprises. We want to do Africa. We want to do Southeast Asia. Yeah. We want to do Latin America, where maybe some of the producers do not have a huge amount of product. Mm -hmm. But if they want to do the franchise, we are now launching this franchise model with the hardware model, with our patent, and with a lot of our software, so they can actually operate it themselves. Cool. Okay. That's an exciting development. Um, how does BlendHub compare or add value versus other local blenders? Um, this is a funny question because, again, uh, it's a little bit based on our traditional mindset. You know, when you go out and the first uh, hop we, we, we set up in India, we ended up that some companies came to us and say, your quality is too good because this guy on the other side, he's blending and packaging five cents cheaper. And I said, five cents in a product that costs $10. Is this what you're worried about? Because if this is what you're worried about, Blendhub is not your supplier. Right. So one of the things that I really want to highlight here again is not that we are better or worse than local blender because we are, we are probably not. Mm -hmm. The thing is that when you create a network of hops, anyone that comes to you, for example, you're a winner of the TFF Brazil last year. Yeah. We can host them anywhere in the world so they can be on the market in 30 days with a new food product. Yeah. No local blender. So think about that you do not need your engineers to go and check the factories. Yeah. You do not need your quality department to go and see that the factory is okay. So there are so many savings by putting your product onto a network of production hubs. And this is yeah. why we continue supporting that. Yeah, you get the economies of scale, but in this like localized way. So yeah, that's super interesting. I, I'm keeping taking ones from the audience and then I want to transition to, to also get to get to know you, Henrik, a little better. But do you have any lessons for startups who are starting powder-based products? You know, I think 
I think it's fascinating today compared to 20 years ago or 22 years ago when I started because um, there are so many incubators, accelerators, you know, all kinds of fancy words. I must admit one thing, yeah. I don't understand them. <laughs> so Yeah, it's like our own vernacular in startup land, it's true. But, but yeah. think about it, you know, in a certain way, you have a group of people until 35 who yeah. publicly say they do not want to buy branded food products anymore. They want traceability, security, and prediction, right? Yeah. So on one side, you have a part of the industry that have to reinvent themselves. And this is, of course, what many of the big food producers are doing. Yeah. And this is, of course, why they run incubators and accelerators, because then they get all the good ideas from outside. Yeah. In a certain way, it's fine. I have no problem whatsoever. But if you are only passionate by entrepreneurship and startup because you want to sell your business off in a year, I don't think you're an entrepreneur. And I'm sorry to say it mm -hmm. because the best entrepreneurs, and I'm seeing, thanks God, a lot of young people who are very, very passionate about changing the world and certainly not passionate about selling. Yeah. My reason for, for you know, deploying all this is that I want to help startups to be successful. And by the way, just for your information, our deployment of hops is 10 times cheaper than the factory we built in Spain. So even with a very low capacity on this production hop, we can actually support small medium enterprises without the necessity to get all the big ones to support us. So if you are an entrepreneur today, try to not scale too fast try to you know get the right things onto the market try to you know these uh, uh, american uh, girls that marie your colleague marie presented yeah. with agri cycle global one of our boost teams yeah it's crazy about you know they have created a business based on some tons a very very small volume in the beginning and now they have reinvented the supply chain and now they are growing if they had not been on that track as entrepreneurs this would not have, have happened. And now today they have 11,000 farmers that are happy thanks to them. You know, these are the kind of things that I think entrepreneurs today have to think about. Yeah. And I guess that really excites you because you're like at your core an entrepreneur, which I find fascinating because your company is like, what did you say, 17 or 20 years old? It's 22 years old. 20 we are 160 years. people. And uh, we Raising are doing your series A, <laughs> but you know, you're like in startup mode, but that's, I mean, I have to say like TFF ourselves, we're seven, I guess going on eight years old, but we still are like a startup in everything that we do. And I think that keeps you fresh and open and kind of like let serendipity happen, which is exactly how you're able to take on these opportunities. We call ourselves a startup with 20 years of history. Exactly. <laughs> so, I mean, but I also think like particularly in food and ag, these times Time horizons are quite normal for like how you can make impact because it is a very like complex you know industry with all of these like local nuance and how food products are like produced and what's consumed etc so I think your approach is really really fascinating and I want to transition a little bit to like you yourself and how you keep yourself like in that state of mind where you can be innovative you know you've been building this company and doing incredible things but yet seeing opportunities like every time you turn around so how do you do that um again is that just a superhero skill <laughs> uh, i think you know it's 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 all come from passion and of course you end up believing that there must be more between uh, you know more in the earth around that that gives you this energy so yeah. i'm extremely energetic but the thing is as well that I have a normal saying that one plus one have to be more than two. Yeah. So in a certain way, if you're constantly challenging yourself and a lot of my people around me, they say, you're crazy. Hey, you have enough. You don't need you that. But in the end, you know, I admire uh, great entrepreneurs and thanks God today, we can read about them online, you know, read yeah. about a guy like Steve Jobs or, or Jeff Bezos or Elon Musk, you know, it's just, yeah. it's just a pleasure, you know, and I don't care what is behind because when people are challenging the status quo, I think that, that, that everything initially is good. And as long as, of course, they are good people as well and they, they want yeah. well, in the end, this is what it's all about. And my energy- you know, our mantra here at TFF, I don't know if you can see that. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Uproot the status quo, yeah. Exactly. But I think that the only way that you really get energized is by talking to young people. So one of the things 
And I have my, my mentor and my good friend, my, my old CEO in the ingredients company. He is still today on my advisory board. He's 76 years or 77 years old or whatever. Sorry, Hans, if I'm wrong. <laughs> but, uh, but you know, he is so passionate. He is so fantastic a person that every time we have an advisory board meeting, the, 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 the thing we do before, the night before is going having a great dinner and, and talking about everything, you know? You are so lucky about that because I was actually like recently reading about this, like how important mentorship is. It was Seth Godin actually. And he said, you know, his advice for young entrepreneurs is it's very rare actually to have what you have, which is that mentor who like sticks with you through thick and thin and really like teaches you and, and is also a sparring partner. Um, and so one of the recommendations he gives in his little all MBA course is if you don't have that, make one up. And it can be like a person that you make up or it can be like a celebrity that you look up to and you kind of like put personas and you think to yourself, like, in my case, what would Lady Gaga do or whatever, you know, um, but like having a mentor is so important. How do we find those like as, you know, young entrepreneurs trying to live well, our passion? Really simple. It's actually more simple than, than it really sounds because... When you're young, you yeah. always look up. I, I always admired age, you know, in a certain way. And when, when you admire age yeah. and, and you don't have to take what, what age is telling you, but you have to take the guideline and say, hey, why do the same failure twice? Right. So the first thing, if you say, hey, for example, I took my, my friend and mentor and we traveled to Silicon Valley in 2012. Mm -hmm. And, you know, he said, why do you want me to Silicon Valley? I'm, you know, all that. I'm sick and tired of all that. But in the end, we came, we came back. And in September 2012, and I still remember it as was yesterday, because in August, I was on vacation. I was on the phone. I said, I want you to write a memo so more people understand what we, what we did. And uh, we called it, he called it a window of opportunity. Mm -hmm. And to be in the middle of a gentleman who you bring with you with his vision that is of course not the same as yours yeah on one side is able to write a memo called the window of opportunity towards the future this is what i was inspired and again having young people behind you i'm giving let's say everyone that is around me the time to talk and this is yeah. why what i said to you before i call it floating most of my time I actually prefer not really to have a day job at work, but like actually the, uh, floating around and yeah. talking uh, to people. So the people, for example, I have a story as well about, about this. We have a guy in Blendhub today that is son of a very important businessman in Spain, you know, mm -hmm. and he's called Pablo and he's an incredible guy. Mm -hmm. And I met him, I was, I was in the EY worldwide, you know, this uh, yeah. entrepreneur of the year in Monaco. Yeah. And I was in the middle of this big meeting room with hundreds of people. And there's a Spanish guy that stands up in the back in front of Mark Cuban and says, Mark, I want a job with you, you know? And he said a couple of other things. <laughs> and later on, I was looking, I said, I, I went to see him. I said, who are you? Because you're Spanish. So I says, Pablo, I said, Mark Cuban is not going to take you, but I am. Oh my God. <laughs> so, so I made a deal with him. Be audacious, you never know, yeah. Him and and you're going to love the deal. I have I have four children myself. My oldest is 21. Yeah. So I said to Pablo, I said you are. I think he's now 26, 27. Mm -hmm. I said I need you in exchange to do me one thing. Otherwise, I'm not hiring you. I want you as mentor for my oldest son that at that time was 18, and I want you to take a flight. So we took an EasyJet flight to London. He had dinner with my son. And he came back and I hired him. So this is, this is how you create mentorships. This is how you create relationships. How do you create friends? Yeah. This is just the same. Well, it's funny you have that story because I have a similar story where I was at a conference once in Alabama of all places. And I raised my hand, asked a kind of audacious question. And the guy came up to me in the networking and said, okay, interesting question. We're going to keep carrying on this conversation. And, you know, he actually is a core partner now to Thought for Food and, one, and offers a, you know, impact uh, investment prize. So it's like, you have to be bold, right? And just go up and make those intros. That's a little bit the hustling entrepreneur's way. So um, I wanted to ask you two more questions from the audience um, because this time has just flown by and I want to spend even more with you. But, um, okay, so, 
I guess like this is a little bit around the entrepreneur's way, but it's basically like, how do you crack this nut of funding? Which is like, especially hard for our TFFers, right? Because we're like early stage entrepreneurs, a lot of time coming from emerging economies, right? And without a lot of um, experience under our belts, because we are like leaders of the next generation. So what are, you know, the funding options? Where, where are the places we can go um, to get that kind of like pre-seed investment to keep ourselves going? The funny, thing, the funny thing about funding, and maybe I'm not the right person to ask that question because I, I self-funded, you know, so yeah. because I don't trust so many of these money that comes to me, I prefer to invest in myself. You know? yourself, yeah. I'm a little bit coward in, in, in that sense, right? So yeah. um, the thing is that when you look through, and I like to study things, you know, mm -hmm. uh, I remember, by the way, in Monaco, Mark Cuban, he says, anything I don't understand I start reading six books about it and then I go to three conferences and then I start understanding. Sincerely speaking, I did not understand funding very well. For me, it was always something secondary. The thing is that um, you today, you have traditional banks and banks today is not your funding option. Yeah. And then you have, for example, you have debt funds. Today, for example, when you're doing something truly new that can impact, for example, emerging markets, you have a lot of funding opportunities that is related to the part of the world where you want to impact. So we are, for example, today talking to IFC in Washington, part of the World Bank. Yeah. That's very new to me, you know, in a certain way. A different, like, yeah. You talk to the right funding partners and you tell them your real story. You look them into their eyes. And if this is something that fits them, in the end, I continue the conversation. If it is somebody, and I have a lot of people that come to me and say, I like your idea, but I want 30% Roy. I said, thank you very much. I will take it slow. So I think it is very, very important that right money find right projects. I love that. You never, ever take the wrong money because this is suicide. Gosh, I needed to hear that myself today. <laughs> <laughs> um, and here's a question that we can leave with in the final 10 minutes, because I think there's two parts to it. Where do you see Blend Hub 10 years from now? And where do you see yourself 10 years from now? I added that second part, but I'm very curious what an innovator like you will be doing in 10 years. You know, I'm a dreamer. So that's, that's probably, that's probably the question as a Dane, there is something in Denmark called Yendelon. And that was why I left Denmark, because do never say anything. Do, do not try to put your head in front and tell anyone that you are better than you, you really are, because then we will chop it off. Oh, gosh. And I hate that system. This yeah. is sincerely, I left Denmark because I could not support that young people are not allowed to think big. Yeah. And I, I, I think not big. I want everything. <laughs> The world but, is mine. <laughs> but, yeah. but I want impact. And as I said just before on the monetary side, I'm never ever going to compromise myself. I'm not saying that I cannot make a, a, a mistake. I could take the wrong money. I could take the wrong partner, you know, but I'm really trying hard to avoid it. And that has costed me a lot of, I put a lot of money on the table. I like, for example, a guy like Gary Vaynerchuk, He's always talking about happiness. He talks to the young people, but he also talks to me, you know, mm -hmm. to, to have a sustainable business model, to have a, a career that is based on the right people and value alignment is much more important than yeah. just reach success at any price. But I want everything. So I continue, you know, first of all, I see Blendhop, sincerely speaking, having hundreds or maybe thousands of deployments of production hubs around the globe because i know the volumes that are being blended and packed i know where the food is moving look yeah. at solar foods powder protein from insects you know yeah. there will be more and more and more powder sure. there will be more and more localization i know the impact on prices there will be lower and lower prices there will be better and better quality mm -hmm. and i want to participate in all that so when i say i want everything I want all that. Yeah, yeah. Because the only way that you can do that is to be extremely collaborative with other people. And this is why that Blendhub will be a platform. Blendhub will not be 
a company like you know it today where Amazon is on the stock exchange and suddenly Jeff Bezos dumps a lot of money. And I know that this is not political correct, but you know, in the end, we wanna, we wanna turn the world of food into a sustainable platform. And personally, I would love to lead that. I have the capabilities. Of course. I have the experience. The vision. And, and I am humble enough, you know, not to want to take all the medals myself. I just, I just would love to do this mm -hmm. because I think it's a pity if we don't do that together. I feel like this is like an acceleration, you know, inflection point based on what we're seeing as a result of like COVID and this like hyper localization that is starting to permeate a lot of the discussion. So I, I think that your time is now. <laughs> so, <laughs> and last question, favorite book or favorite like role model that can inspire, you know, our community and we can, because I'm not a technician whatsoever. Um, I have, let's say, really have had very big inspiration from certain people. Um, I think everyone needs to read uh, the 1990 version of Crossing the Chasm with Jeffrey Moore. Mm -hmm. uh, I think Jeffrey, uh, who is an old timer in the, in the technology adaption space, I think that it will give an incredible amount of insights for any young entrepreneur of understanding what is, uh, what is innovators, what is early adapters, what is main market pragmatist uh, conservatives and laggards. Right. Uh, technology adoption, it's not only, always the best product that wins, it's yeah. the smartest product. Yeah. A second guy that I really recommend everyone to, to, to follow is Alexander Osterwalder, the business model canvas. Yeah. I think it has nothing to do with product. It has all to do with business models. So, um, so I'm very, very uh, keen on exploring business models. And the other thing, when you go into the platform space, there is a guy called Sanji Chowdhury that I had the pleasure and talk with the other day uh, from his home, uh, from his home in Singapore. Yeah. Uh, that has been writing about platform strategies. I think. Every young person today need to understand that it is not winner takes it all. It's about win, win, win. Yeah. And Sanji has uh, some incredible insights on the world of platforms. And especially one thing I would like you to, to look at is the power of flywheels. Mm -hmm. So there is actually, and I've not been able to catch up with them sometimes, coming back to the money. I sometimes, when I'm in the evening, I send three or four mails to one of the contact pages on the American Venture Capital Funds. There is a capital fund that actually I like reading that is called NFX in the US. Yeah. I don't know the guys. There is a guy called, I think, James Courier or something. Mm -hmm. They are saying incredible things about the power of networks and hidden network effects that has a lot to do with flywheels. Yeah. So, yeah. so think about crossing the chasm, business model canvas, platform strategies and flywheels. Amazing. This is so much food for thought for Thought for Food. It was such an energizing pleasure to be with you. I know that our community is going to want to get in touch with you. So I hope you'll be open to that and can pass them to the relevant colleagues in your business. But what an exciting thing that you're doing. You are an exciting and visionary person. And I'm looking forward to continuing to collaborate with you and with Glen Hope. So stay safe, stay healthy, stay sane, have fun. I know you will. <laughs> and uh, we will be back um, soon with more live sessions. And thank you to everyone and our attendees. Um, and we look forward to catching you on our next event. Well, thanks to everyone. And I hope they were not too bored. You know, it's always... <laughs> I literally, like, I was like, oh my gosh, I got a ping that my time was running out. I, I didn't even notice. So that is incredible. Thank you so much. It was great yeah. being on, on with you today and we'll continue talking. Thanks. Everyone's saying they loved it. Okay. Have a great evening. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye.